Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Open Door Bible Church. I'd like to invite you to come in from the vestibule and the hallway and the streets and hot byways and come in and uh, have a seat in our auditorium as we pre uh, begin to prepare for our worship service. And a special welcome to those of you joining us online. If you'll leave a little note that you're uh, there, we would appreciate knowing about it. Thank you. Let me see here. For In the bulletin, uh, Young Adult Bible Study this Wednesday. Uh, next Sunday, Josh Johnson will be speaking. And of course, we have our privilege to have Michael and Lindy uh, Busenitz here with us this morning. Um, I mentioned to my uh, MAF friend down in Ecuador, Jim Manley, that I thought I knew about avionics. He said, no, John, it doesn't work that way at all. The, the propeller in front, that's for air conditioning because when it stops, the pilot starts to perspire. <laughs> so I learned a lot from Jim about avionics. Um, I was talking to another pastor friend of mine. We were talking about uh, missionaries and the mission funds, and he was complaining, uh, bemoaning the fact, you know, it's hard to get a congregation interested in missions nowadays, to see outside the four walls. And I said, well, the church that we attend, that we're members of, 20% of the general fund goes to missions. About 50% of the people who are here in the congregation have either been on the mission field or have children on the mission field, or somehow involved in missions. And, oh, by the way, have you heard of Frank Marie Drown? He said, well, of course. <laughs> they happened to be members of the church before they passed on to heaven. And he said, John, do you realize how blessed you are to be a member of that congregation? And I said, yes. It is a blessing, not only for that reason, and I emphasize the mission part because of the uh, mission emphasis we have this morning. But just to say, it is a blessing, a high blessing and privilege to be with you all, to be a member of this family, and especially as we begin now to prepare for worship together. I mean really big. Let's talk about... God's will. I mean, when it comes to honoring God with our lives, I mean, this is a really big deal. As a matter of fact, there, that's better. Understanding God's will, it may not be as hard as we tend to make it. Let me show you what I mean. Knowing God's will may be as easy as figuring out what we like and what we don't like. Uh, figuring out the things that we're passionate about and those things that we can really care less about. The things that we're good at and the things that we're not so good at. Figuring out those things that we love to do, it helps us, it puts us in the center of God's will. But here's the deal, God's will never contradicts, yep, you guessed it, the Bible. God's will never contradicts God's word. Let me show you what I mean. So here's the question, how many people truly feel like they're living in the center of God's will? Well, that's, I mean, that's really pretty easy. I mean, 43.765% of all Christians believe they're living in God's will. Seriously? I don't know, I just made up that number. Well, why did you do that? Because I wanted to use this board thing. It's, that's awesome. Go away. Sorry. As I was saying, most people kind of fumble through knowing God's will. It kind of leaves us in the state of indecision. Yes, indecision. That, that would be me too. Like, um, where am I going to go to college? Who am I going to marry? Um, you know, uh, should I eat the pastrami that's left over in the kitchen? You know, I mean, I don't know how old it is. Is it bad? How do you know if pastrami's bad? And then they decide not to make a sequel to Goonies. What am I going to do now? It has been said. Yeah, that's mine. It has been said that God loves us and has a wonderful plan for our lives. So, what if we mess up? Does that mean all bets are off when it comes to knowing God's will? Yes. N no, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You see, if you mess up, if you fall flat on your face, because of God's grace, you can pick yourself up and commit your ways to the Lord. Speaking of commit. I don't know if you realize it or not, but the Hebrew word for commit is galal. It means to roll upon another, to, uh, to 
roll upon God. Mm, that's good. How did, how, did you, how did you know that? Not just another pretty face. I got smarts. <laughs> Did you, did you just, did you just trip? Yeah. Over what? Myself. I'm a wreck. And I think that's it. At some point in everybody's lives, we feel like a wreck. And what does God say to do? God says to roll with it, to roll upon Him, not unto others or to see what the world has to offer as pleasurable and enticing, but to present our bodies as living sacrifices to God, holy and pleasing. And when we quit trying to please God, sin isn't too far behind. Sin kind of prevents us from being everything that we can be for God. Kind of binds us up. Oh, speaking of bind, I had a chalupa the other day. Ugh, bound. What, what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing? I'm just, just trying to get in on what you're doing. I mean, I can't figure out what you want me to be. I just want you to be yourself. Follow the desires of your heart. And I think that's it. When it comes to God's will, knowing God's will, it's just be yourself. Do what you can with what you have and leave the results up to God. Hey, would you help me? To do what? I, I'm not real good at being me, so I thought I'd try at being you. So I just help me shave my hair. No, I'm not shaving your head. Fine, I'll do it by myself. That hurts more than I thought it would. Ow! That's gonna leave a mark. I'm bleeding. Oh, I'm bleeding. I got a vein. Call to worship this morning comes from 1 Timothy, the second chapter. Here's a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. But if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Lord God, Jehovah, King of the universe, we gather together this morning after having faced a week of shifting sand. We faced it in leaders and work and friends and for some of us in our families. And if we're truthful with you, Lord, we've even faced it within ourselves. And that's why, Lord, we're so grateful for the solid and movable rock we find in you. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the only one we can truly depend upon to take care of our past, to help us handle the present, and we trust you alone for our eternities. Help us at this moment as we gather to worship your holy name. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus, and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and begin to sing praises to the Lord this morning. We've come together to worship the Lord for who he is and what he's done, for what he's doing in Mexico, as well as in our own hearts this morning. So let's begin with this song together. Oh 
Let's look forward to, um, to celebrating Christ's power to save this morning. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, it is mighty to save forever, author of 
salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the
distant ways would break me. For in my weakness I have learned, your strength will not forsake me. Oh, Jesus, I will hide in you, the one who bears my burdens, with faithful hands that cannot fail, you'll bring me home to heaven. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, I will hide in you, the one who bears my burdens. so glad that you're with us today, and uh, in just a minute we're going to have uh, Michael and Lindy come up and we'll be praying for them. Uh, the elders will be coming at that time. Let's just quickly go through some of the others. Now see, if someone invited me to speak at a conference and they'd bring me that way, I'd go in a heartbeat. Anyway, that's my favorite picture of theirs. Uh, Vic and Gwen, they're actually uh, working out of Nebraska, and so they do a lot of their stuff remotely. Um, they, are, they work with lots of people who are in desperate need of learning how to apply God's principles and learning how to work with other believers. That's, believe it or not, amongst missionaries and national workers and pastors, that's a big deal sometimes. And ministries have, uh, have failed or have had to go totally different directions because of that. And, and Vic and Gwen, they're the people that are trying to help those kinds of situations to be resolved in a biblical way. So pray for Vic and Gwen, and pray for her especially right now. She's gone through chemotherapy, and she's um, really struggling with it right now. So please pray that she would be able to regain her strength. Remember, they had a big event that they were doing online together, and their prayer request was that she'd even be able to be a part of it. So understand, that's what's going on for Vic and Gwen. Let's go to the next one. Jacob and Linda Weeby, who work down in Durango, and... Um, there's all kinds of stuff going on with them. Uh, they just, uh, I don't know how many churches this is that they've officially started and planted, but they just formally registered the papers and did everything for the church that they've been planting right now. And it's small right now, and yet they're still doing all kinds of things, like going on a mission trip. They've already done several of those with this group of believers, and they're going down into uh, Weichol country to some of the places we talked about, Michael shared. And they're going to help a congregation put a roof up so they'll have a place where they can meet that's out of the sun and, and out of the rain. Um, also, they are looking themselves for either the ability to purchase the building they're in or to be able to purchase land and build a building. So pray for that as well. And there's all kinds of stuff that go on. They shared in their prayer letter. If you didn't get it, please send an email to the church. We'll make sure that you do. But they... Um, they know in, in many people in that community already in Nuevo Ideal, and so they were going to a funeral of someone who had been in the church in the past, and as they were going to that funeral, someone from that family passed away from the stress of it all. Someone who was on their way to the funeral was hit head-on and, and passed away, and uh, a day or so later, a fourth person from that family also passed away, and so they're involved in all of that, and if you can imagine, it's just like a wave after wave after wave hitting this family. And Jacob and Linda are able to be there to be able to minister and to encourage and to help. And, and uh, they did a whole lot of things at those, uh, at those memorial services to be of encouragement to the family. Pray that God would touch that family with the gospel as well. Some of them knew the Lord, but some of them did not. So uh, continue to pray for them. Uh, we're going to go ahead at this point and call Mike and Michael and Lindy up, and if the elders would all come up, please, we'll take a moment to pray for them. Now, this is, this is big news. I, I saw this in their prayer letter. Come on up. They had a picture, and Lindy is officially the shortest in the family now. So, I'm sorry, I had to share. <laughs> Let's go ahead and gather around, guys. And I'll, I'll go ahead and just lay hands on and we'll pray for them. And, and would you 
be praying with us as well. Lord God, we thank you so much for Michael and Lindy and their family. Lord, they've gone into uh, Chihuahua and other places of Mexico all over, and really, and, and, and your word is going forth because of the ministry that they do. So we thank you for them. We pray for your encouragement and your strengthening during this time at home and, and uh, just help during the wedding that's coming up. All of those things, Lord, we, we bring to you. And we ask that you would give them that peace and that contentment that comes only from you. Keep them safe as they travel uh, here in the States, as they go around and make all the visits they need to make. Help them to be able to encourage others and for themselves also to be encouraged. And we continue, Lord, to pray for them and the ministries in which they're involved and that you would bless them in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's just take a second to look at some of our other prayer requests. Um, Matt Barnes, this next week, is going to be the speaker at one of the camps in, at Whispering Winds. So please pray for Matt. Uh, if you've ever even just been to camp as a counselor, you know how much work that is. Now you become a, the speaker, and it's ten times more. So just pray for him. He enjoys doing it, but it's hard work. So we, we will be praying for you, Matt. Also... Um, Pray for Sherilyn Davis. She's here again today, and we're thankful for that, but keep on praying. Amen. Yeah. John, John Herman, I don't think I saw him sneak in, but John's here with us as well. Um, continue to pray for Craig as he continues to be strengthened for Wendy, uh, Aaron's sister, uh, that the radiation and that the... Um, Chemo would actually work and take care of that tumor. I continue to pray for Cami as uh, the treatment has been effective so far. I continue to pray that that treatment would be and continue to be effective for Daryl with the pain that he's going through. And I'm thankful for Bill being here. But again, pray for all the medications and things that he's been on and how they're trying to work those out. Uh, pray for that situation as well. And continue to pray for Linda's sister, uh, Don Guerrero's sister, Linda. Let's pray together. Lord, I just thank you so much that you are, sometimes we forget, we get in a hurry, and we're trying to get things done and trying to go here and trying to go there, and we forget maybe even to lift people up in prayer as we should, and yet, God, you are constant, and you are there, and you are working and in each situation that we just mentioned each brother or sister that we just asked for we ask for your ongoing strengthening and encouragement and lord your healing hand on everyone lord we know that you are in control of all things and so we thank you that you know what you're doing and even when it's hard for us to figure it out lord god we thank you and we praise you for the work that you do in our lives and in our and in our hearts Thank you, Lord, for the fact that you are at work in our church family, and I pray that you would continue to do so. And today, as we move forward and we hear from your word and as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, Lord, just make this a real special time for us. May we sense your presence. May our hearts rise in praise, worship, and adoration to you. We ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand one more time together before we look into God's Word. And uh, let's sing this hymn as a preparation. Um, while we've seen kids up through fifth grade, can keep an eye out for the slide to head downstairs to Children's Church if your family would like to take advantage of that. And of course, uh, everyone is always welcome to stick around for the, uh, for the rest of the service here as well. Let's sing all four verses of this hymn before we look into God's Word together. Church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and saw. 
altar to be his holy bride with his own blood he bought her and for her thy feet died elect from every nation yet one o'er oh, all the earth the charter of salvation one Lord one faith one birth one holy name she blesses partakes one holy fruit and to one hope she presses with every grace in mutual and and reading together selection from Acts. Reading together. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? And others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Arab Pepicus, and where they said to him, may we know that this new teaching is that you are presenting. You're trying to present strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. And all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Have a seat, please. Good morning. It's good to see you again. It's been two years. Every two years, we uh, do a quick lap through the U.S., mostly Missouri and Kansas, to share an update about what the Lord's doing in our ministry in Mexico. And so it's been two years again, a strange two years. But it's only been two years. <laughs> it felt longer in many ways for many reasons. Um, it's good to be here. This year is year 20 for us. We'll have been in Mexico in November 20 years. And um, you guys have been with us from the start. So we appreciate your longstanding participation in our ministry. Uh, I enjoyed that last song. Actually, I enjoyed all the songs this morning. But that last song, the next to last verse speaks of the church in toil and tribulation, waiting for our relief, which will come in time. But we're living in, in peculiar days, aren't we? We're living in days when it appears 
that there's an increasing hostility to those who would share the gospel. There's an increasing pushback against what it is to be a Christian, to live out a real Christian life. But really, if we look at the history of the world, as, as we look at the history of believers, what we have enjoyed is an anomaly. The peace, tranquility, prosperity that we've experienced, experienced and are experiencing has been foreign to most of our brethren throughout history. And so, um, we're facing a changing time, and maybe we need a little bit of a, a realignment, if you will, to what the mission of the church is. The question really is, in a changing society, in an ever more hostile society, how do we share the gospel? How do we go about mission work and evangelism in this changing society? Uh, to do that, I'd like to look at the example of the pa Apostle Paul and extract some of the principles that he lived by and apply them to our lives, specifically from his time in uh, Athens. So if you look at your text in Acts chapter 17, verse 16, it says, and I'll be reading from the NASB, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens... His spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. And the question is, it says there that he's waiting for them in Athens. Who's the them? What's he waiting for? Um, this is Paul's second missionary journey. He had set out with Silas, and they'd gone up through what we now call Turkey, Asia Minor, and they'd been in the south, and they'd been in the east, and God prevented them from going into the north and going to the west, and instead they'd uh, come across into Europe, the Macedonian call, you'll remember. And they came across to Europe, and they landed and uh, went to Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and then on to Athens. And the interesting thing about that trip is all along the way, Paul is facing persecution, so much so that he drops off uh, Silas and Timothy in Berea, and he's moved on alone to Athens, and that is who he is waiting for. He's waiting on Paul, on uh, Silas and Timothy to catch up to him. So he's in Athens waiting. Now remember, this is his second missionary journey. Quick tour through his first and second missionary journey. In Pisidian Antioch, he faced opposition and persecution. In Iconium, he escaped the plot to stone him. He moved on to Lystra. There they actually did stone him and left him for dead. Second missionary journey. He makes it into Europe, the gospel for the first time in Europe. In Philippi, he's beaten and imprisoned and then released via earthquake. In Thessalonica, riots break out against them, threatening their safety, and so they're moved on by night to Berea. The church moves them out of there. And then in Berea, the folks from Thessalon Thessalonica show up there and again threaten his safety, and so he's moved on by himself to Athens. Paul has been ministering in a hostile environment. His whole missionary experience, his whole life was being chased from city to city to city and beaten and imprisoned and stoned or threatened with those things. And so he comes to Athens alone for all intents and purposes, waiting for his ministry partners. Athens, we know as the cradle of democracy. Athens had her heyday back about 500 years before this, when she was the ruling city in Greece. She was then replaced by the Macedonians, and then in 146, or about 200 years before this, Rome conquers Athens. So now Rome is in charge, and militarily Athens is not what she used to be. She was the powerhouse, but now no longer. But when it came to philosophical debate, scholasticism, and intellectual reputation, Athens was still at the top of the heap. Athens was known as a reputable place of learning, debate, reason, and oratory. So while waiting for Silas and Timothy to catch up in Athens... Paul did what so many people do in Athens today. They go and have a look around, right? That's what folks do. And when he looked around town, 
he saw much of what you would see the remnants of today. All those massive temples, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Parthenon and the, the massive temple structures that you see on top of the hill in Greece were there at that time. They'd been built 400, 500 years earlier. You would have seen, uh, he would have seen all the altars and the idols around town that still are there to this day. So in some ways, he was like a tourist today, right? But Paul's response is interesting. He didn't um, take selfies with the Greek columns to post on Facebook. He didn't start a YouTube travel vlog. He didn't Snapchat himself with a gyro sandwich and a side of hummus. Paul was observing the city through a biblical, scriptural grid. And what he saw was in verse 16, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols, idolatry everywhere. In verse 23, it says that he examined their articles of worship. That would be their temples and their altars and their idols. He observed, he looked, he examined. He was paying attention through a spiritual grid. His observation and examination of Athens revealed that the city was full of idols, it says. It wasn't just a thing here or there. The city is full of idols. They were, there were a lot of them. It was unavoidable. William Barclay wrote, quote, It was said that there were more statutes of gods in Athens than in all the rest of Greece put together. A city full of idols. Uh, that's substantiated by secular writers as well. Jameson and Fawcett Brown and Brown say, quote, Petronius, a contemporary writer at Nero's court, says satirically that it was easier to find a god in Athens than a man. Rampant idolatry throughout the city of Athens. She was known for that. And we see the relics of that all the way down to this day. It says that as he was seeing this city filled with idols, his spirit was being provoked within him. It bothered Paul what he saw. It stirred him up. It got to him. It vexed him. It got under his, sin, uh, under his skin. Can we stop for a minute and apply Paul's response there? Paul evaluated through a spiritual grid what he saw, and he was provoked. We live in a society full of idolatry, don't we? The pursuit of everything but God. Do we evaluate our society as Paul did through a spiritual grid? Have we spent enough time, real time, in God's Word so we have a spiritual grid through which to filter and evaluate our society. And when I observe the society in sin, a society full of idols like ours and growing in idolatry, is my spirit provoked? Or am I just annoyed? Or grossed out? Or proud? Or angry? Or frustrated? Or discouraged? What's my response? to seeing a society filled with idolatry. Does the lostness of our society bother you? Or have we become so acquainted with it that our society feels kind of homey to us? We're at home in it. Paul sees a city steeped in idolatry, and he's provoked. And he doesn't leave it at just being provoked. He responds. Look at verse 17. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. Paul's spirit was provoked, so he began reasoning with them. The word for reasoning there is the same word we get the word dialogue from. He began conversing with them, exchanging ideas based on reason. Paul responded to idolatry by speaking to them. And 
the question, of course, right away is, what did Paul speak about? Well, if you look down at verse 18, it says that he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. That's the core of the gospel. Paul sees the society, sees the idolatry, and goes straight to the gospel. His topic was the gospel. And we ask, where did Paul preach the gospel? Paul's had a lot of opposition now. He's been stoned. He's been incarcerated. He's been chased from place to place. Maybe Paul will change his methodology a little bit. Maybe it's time to get a little quieter. So where did Paul preach? His trip to Europe so far hasn't been so good. It says he preached in the synagogue and in the marketplace. In the synagogue, that's the Jewish place of worship, the Jewish place of learning. So that's indoors with a select group. But then it says he's in the marketplace. He's out in the open. So the question is, did Paul change his methodology? No. He preached everywhere, inside and outside, in private and in public. And the question then is, with whom? Maybe he changed whom he talked to. Verse 17 says, he was in the synagogue with the Jews and God-fearing Gentiles, those are the proselytes, those who were Gentiles who had converted to Judaism. He's talking to Jews and those who had been outside, but now were in the Jewish belief system. And then it says, he was in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. So he's in the synagogue with Jews and proselytes to Judaism and in the market with anybody else around. So he didn't change where he spoke. He spoke inside and outside. He didn't change with whom he spoke. He spoke to everybody. The question is then, well, maybe he limited. Maybe he picked times when it would be a little bit more opportune than other times. When did he preach the gospel? It says he was in the synagogue. That's likely on the Sabbath, right? That's when they met. So on the Sabbath day, he's in the select group. And in the marketplace every day. So on the Sabbath, he's in the synagogue, and all the other days, he's out in the marketplace. You know, this reminds me of my grandpa on my mom's side, Grandpa Dalkey. He used to say, I only drink coffee on two occasions, when I'm alone or when I'm with somebody. I said, only two times he drinks coffee. That's Paul's approach to preaching the gospel. He only preaches the gospel when he's in the synagogue or somewhere else. He only preaches it with the Jews and proselytes to Judaism or with anybody else. He only preaches it on the Saturdays on the Sabbath or any other day of the week. Paul is grieved by idolatry, <clears throat> and he moves to the gospel and speaks it whenever, wherever, to whomever. Question, in terms of an application, If we're bothered by the growing sin and hostility in our society around us, how do you respond? How do I respond? We may perceive it. We know it's not good. But how do you respond? If you're stirred up, how do you respond? Is our response a complaint to a fellow believer about how bad things are getting? Do you stew, maybe, within your heart about the terrible conditions? Do you privately have some resentment that, man, I have to be alive in this time when the wheels are coming off? Why couldn't I live a genera- have lived a generation or two ago? Do you complain and grumble and post online about the situation? Has society's growing idolatry and hostility turned you into a downer in the church? or in your family, or at your place of business. Paul sees the idolatry because he knows the Word. And he's moved because he knows the Lord. And he turns to the only tool he has, which is the gospel, and he proclaims it wherever, whenever, to whomever. That's a great example for us in our changing society. Can I say respectfully, that maybe the modern church needs to stop whining and start witnessing. 
in an ever more godless society, there's an ever-growing need to hear the gospel. And when Paul saw the need, he didn't speak less, he spoke more. Verse 18, Paul didn't change his method or his message, and so he got noticed. Verse 18, and also some of the Epicurean Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. It talks about the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers here. Those were the two main philosopher groups in Athens at the time. And so just in real brief, the Epicureans, their life goal was pleasure and tranquility. Just, just live at peace. And uh, uh, matter, they thought, was eternal. Gods were part of the material universe, material universe, but they were far off, distant gods, estranged from what was happening or very little envir- uh, involvement in what was happening. They had no resurrection, no judgment, and also no hope after death. The Stoics, they believed in logic, and they had the, the belief that there was virtue and self-sufficiency, self-control, rationality, and logic. And they had this one great unifying principle under everything that they called the Logos, which John appropriated, as we know. The gods to them were expressions of that logical principle, and they were pantheists. They saw God in everything. So they were disciplined, and the Epicureans, they were all about uh, ease and comfort. Reminds me of two missionaries we used to fly for. They've left the field. One, I'm not going to say their names because you may run into them. One, uh, I'll use their first name. One, Dor, was a wrestler in college, a state champion, and uh, he was of the philosophy, no pain, no gain. That's a Stoic. And his co-worker, working in the same ministry, said, quote, literally said, quote, no pain? Hey, no pain. Right? That's Epicureans, right? We had those two guys. These guys, being the leading philosophies, and since Paul is speaking everywhere all the time to whomever, they hear about it, and they start talking to him. Some spoke disdainfully of Paul. It says, they said, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Idle babbler here is the word seed picker. The idea is it's like a pigeon or a hen, a chicken, that goes around and picks a seed here and a seed there and cobbles together a meal. The idea is Paul is a third-rate philosopher picking a little from over here and a little there and cobbling together a low-class philosophy. And look at the Look at how, how disdainfully they speak. Not as he a, only a seed picker, say seed picker, they say, what would this idle babbler wish to say? It's like he's got an idea, but he can't get it out. He can't quite get it all together. He's trying to say something, but he can't get it together. Others, in the second half of verse 18, had a little more curious approach. It says he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. Paul was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. He wasn't there talking philosophy. He wasn't there talking politics. He wasn't talking local theater performers or the actors doing that. He was talking about Jesus and anastasis, the resurrection the gospel. And so as these guys who live in a city full of idols hear Jesus and Anastasis, resurrection, they think he's speaking of new deities, two new gods, one named Jesus and one named Anastasis. So they're very curious about this, even though disdainful, and they take him to a new venue, verse 19. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. So, time out, Areopagus, what is it? Literally, it's the hill of Ares. That's the god of war. You've also heard it referred to Mars Hill. Mars is the Roman god of war. And this was a group, as a matter of fact, uh, to this day, 
in Greece, the Supreme Court is called the Areopagus. It was a body of people, scholars, philosophers, who evaluated teaching, but they were also involved in court hearings. And they met on a small hill uh, between the big hill in Greece that the, that the, that the, um, the temple's on, and down low in the marketplace, uh, there was a hill in between, a small rocky hill, and that's where they met earlier. But by now, most of the meetings, by Paul's time, most of them took down, place down in the market. The market was a place surrounded by temples. There were temples and altars and courts and place of business. And so uh, that was a place where they often discussed these philosophies. So we're not sure whether they took him to the hill or took him to the marketplace, to the royal basilica there where they met, but they take him here to explain what these things are he's been teaching. He says in verse 18, it says that they said they were strange gods. In verse 19, they say, it's a new teaching. In verse 20, they say, it's strange things. Bottom line, whatever Paul is talking about, they don't understand. They don't get it. This is weird. They didn't believe in a resurrection, so they thought it was a god he was speaking of or a goddess. So if we apply that for a minute or consider it in our society, we can expect our message in an ever more godless society to become ever more ununderstandable, weird sounding to the people we speak to, right? They won't understand, they don't have the foundation. The Greeks and Athens didn't. Our society evermore lacks the foundation to understand our message. So what should we do? Speak less? For fear that it'll sound weird? Or explain the gospel? Paul didn't allow the fact that it would sound strange to them keep him from sharing the gospel. They say, may we know, in verse 19, what this new teaching is which you're proclaiming. In verse 20, we want to know what these things mean. And Paul says, I don't mind if I do. That's not in your text, but that's what he said. I'd love to explain it to you. So off they go to the Areopagus. And Luke puts in a little side comment here, a little editorial note in verse 21. Now, the, the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. That's hyperbole when he says they did nothing other. Obviously, they also walked places and they uh, fed their donkey and watered their cabbage, right? They did other things. That's hyperbole just to say that this was a big deal in Athens, hearing new stuff. So, as a matter of fact, um, Clinton Arnold uh, has a, a quote here from Clinton Arnold. He wrote, the Greek historian... Uh, Thucydides records an observer reproaching the Athenians by saying, you are the best people at being deceived by something new, that is said. You guys love new stuff and you're constantly deceived by new stuff. And so it's not surprising that they want to hear this new stuff. It's such a big deal that Luke needs to put a note in here about it. So Mr. Greek says to Mrs. Greek, hey, uh, what do you want to do for vacation this year? And Mrs. Greek says, let's go to Athens and hear some new stuff, right? Why do we say that? Because it says, even the strangers visiting. Now, all the Athenians and the strangers visiting used to spend their time in nothing other than telling and hearing something new, right? It was a destination location. Let's go hear some new stuff. And so now they've moved on to the Areopagus. And Paul is before this body. And here we hear... Here we see a little bit more of the content of his message. He says in verse 22, So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. He's standing before this august body, these people who are going to evaluate his teaching. These are the guys in the know. It's go time for Paul. Now remember, every time he's run into authorities in Europe, He's been abused or chased off, right? Will he soften his message to accommodate this judicial-type body? He says, Men of Athens, I observe 
that you are very religious in all respects. Now, it's likely that they would have taken that as a compliment, right? Uh, They would have thought, uh, yeah, yeah, we sure are. But the commentators tell us that that word he uses for very religious, it's a single word in the Greek, and it can mean also, also, um, it can mean that you are very rigid in the pursuit of spirits. And the commentators tell us that Paul is already hinting at, hey, it's not as good as it seems. What you're worshiping is spirits, and demons are behind your worship. And Paul doesn't stop with a little hint like that. He goes on to verse 23, For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. He went through and examined their objects of worship, their idols, their altars, their temples, their entire system of worship. Um, This altar they have there to an unknown God he finds. There is a legend. I read D.A. Carson commented on that. There was a legend that years ago, years earlier, they had had a massive uh, epidemic in Athens. And nothing they did with their normal deities worked. They couldn't appease the whatever had caused this massive outbreak. And so one of their prophets brought a flock of sheep to the mount, uh, to the, to, to the um, Mars Hill, and they released the sheep. And wherever one of those sheep stopped and grazed, they built an altar to the unknown God and sacrificed the sheep on that altar, and eventually the, the plague subsided. Some think that that's where this altar came from. And if that's true, there might have been a bunch of altars around to an unknown God. But the bottom line is this. Whatever the actual origin of this altar is, the Athenians recognized a deficiency in their worship system. Their altar, while possibly a badge of honor, is in reality a tacit acknowledgement of spiritual ignorance. It's to an unknown God. It's something they didn't know. And they build this altar. Listen, there's society markers today in our society that tell us that our society admits and knows of its own spiritual ignorance. The constant dissatisfaction with the present condition the constant desire to redefine societal norms, the shouting for change, for more, for deconstructions are signs that they know things are not right and they're trying to change through laws and physical things something that can only be taken care of in spirit, through spiritual means. We've got to read these signs for what they are. Paul saw the altar and he said, "Huh? they admit they don't know. And he's going to key in on that. Do we recognize the cries in society around us? Not for what they're saying so much as what they're admitting to. Their need. Their need. And Paul is going to address this need. Verse 24, he says, What? You worship in ignorance. Note, just real quick, that is not saying, good job that you are worshiping this God in ignorance. Because ignorant worship isn't worship, right? It doesn't matter if uh, we believe something fervently, intently. If it's wrong, it's just wrong. So he's not saying, good job for worshiping something in ignorance. He's saying, you are ignorant. And the emphasis is on the next phrase, this I proclaim to you. Paul is going to preach the gospel to them. Their spiritual ignorance is only overcome through the proclamation of the word. Paul didn't say, okay, I'm going to live out the Christian life in front of these guys for a while and they'll come around. He didn't say, I'm going to do friendship evangelism, be a good neighbor and wait for them. Paul says, what you don't know, the ignorance you have, this I proclaim to you. That's the job of the Christian, proclaiming 
the Word of God, proclaiming the gospel, proclaiming the truth. And the way Paul addresses it is with bold theology. The bottom line is this, verse 24, the God who made the world and all things in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Here's the big theological bit that these guys, it it blew them away. God is the Creator. He went right back to Genesis 1.1. God is the Creator. And because He's the Creator, He's the Lord of heaven and earth. And then He draws this first implication, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Remember where Paul's standing? He's standing below the Acropolis and all the temples there and around the marketplace and all the temples there. And in that environment, he says, God doesn't live in temples. That's what they prided themselves on. And then he moves right on in verse 25 to another conclusion from God the Creator. Nor is he served by humans hands, human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. He is not served by human hands. Your religious system doesn't serve God. Nothing you do is doing anything for God. Your temples are wrong. Your worship system is wrong. He goes on in verse 27 that, to explain that God, uh, in verse 26 and 27, God made all things and He created all nations in the hope that they would reach out for Him, grope for Him, but it's a, it's a blind groping. It's a groping that will never find Him. In verse 28, he quotes some of their philosophers, and I'm speeding things up here a little bit. But in this sermon, he demolishes their entire worship system. Look at verse 29. He says, being then children of God, in other words, descended or originated by God, he's the source. We ought not to think of the divine nature as something like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. He just blew all their idols away. So he comes in, he says, God's the creator. He's the Lord over all. He sustains all. So your temples are useless. Your system of worship and altars is useless. And your idols themselves are useless. The argument Paul presents is that God made the world in all things. Therefore, God is heaven, Lord of heaven and earth. He gives life to all, including man. He organized every nation. He said when they would live and where they would live. And he said why they should live, w- w- would live so that they should reach out for him. Therefore, the conclusion is God is not in man-made temples. God is not sustained by human hands. And God is not made of silver or gold or stone. Conrad Kempf in the New Bible Commentary said, quote, Paul moved on from their admitted ignorance about the true God's identity to arguing that they were also ignorant about where God dwells, they were wrong about what kind of worship God wanted for them, from them, and they were wrong about how God can be thought of or represented. In short, everything about their religiousness was in error except for the admission of ignorance. Guys, that was not a politically correct sermon. That is a slap in the face of modern relative identification and definition. He just said, God is the creator, and this is true, and this is true, and this is true, and this is true. No excuse, no apology, no, you know, I was looking around town, and I kind of feel, I think... Considering everything, well, when you really look at it, no. Just straight truth. The truth of God's Word. The truth of revealed doctrine. Verse 30. Therefore, having overlooked the time of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Based on the truth that God is God, 
all people everywhere should repent. And that phrase, um, therefore having overlooked the times of ignorance, can cause us a little, what do you mean he, over, he overlooked sin? He passed by sin? Put in a nutshell, God was patient. God did not immediately treat sin the way it deserves to be treated. And the fact that you and I are sitting here, standing here, with a breath and a heartbeat is proof that God bears with sinners, right? He's patient. He overlooks for a time. And now he's declaring that all man, men everywhere should repent. You know, that's a call in love. The call to repentance is a call, to love, a call out of love. And why is that so? Because of verse 31, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And just like that, he's back to what he was talking about in the marketplace in the first place. He's speaking of a man raised from the dead. He's speaking of Jesus and the resurrection. He's right back to the gospel. There's a number of indicators that lead us to believe that what we have here is only a short synopsis of a much longer talk. If you just read through this, it's, an, it's a minute and 44 seconds. Paul spoke longer than a minute and 44 seconds. This is Luke's summary of the high points. And Paul got before the Areopagus and preached the gospel. And it's a call of love because God has fixed a day for judgment. He's fixed that day. It's on the divine calendar. It's not movable. It's not changeable. It's there. Look, he's also identified the defendant. It's the inhabited world. He says he will judge the world. People will be in that judgment. He's fixed the day for judgment. He's identified the defendant. He's established the standard, righteousness. He will judge the world in righteousness. What's the righteousness? That's the perfect perfections of God himself. Unless we have the righteousness of Christ in that trial, there's no standing. He judges the world in righteousness on that fixed day by the judge whom he's already appointed, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we asked at the outset, how does Paul minister in a hostile environment? He evaluates it through the grid of the Word of God. He's moved with compassion. He responds with the gospel. He opens his mouth and shares the gospel. And it doesn't matter who, he, who's he, who, who he's around, where he is, or what time, what day of the week it is, everywhere, all the time, with whomever. He proclaimed the gospel to address their spiritual ignorance. You say, what kind of if you're that bold, what kind of uh, results can you get from that? Well, in Paul's case, in verses, the, the closing verses there, you have at least four people who are saved in 32, and 30, 32 to 34. Some sneer in verse 32. Others appear interested. And some believe, including uh, one from one of the Areopagites himself and a lady and some others. Wouldn't you think it's a pretty successful day if you witness and at least four people come to know the Lord, right? It says they believed and followed Him. To close here for a second, we want to be bold in our proclamation of the gospel. Don't talk less, talk more. But if you're here and you read about the fact that God has set a day for judgment, I'm going to be in that judgment. I know I fall short of that judgment, because the standard is perfect righteousness. How can I possibly stand in that judgment? God has an answer for that. The way we survive on the judgment day when God's righteousness is required of us, He offers for us to appropriate the righteousness of the judge Himself. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That's the righteousness 
we need. It's the righteousness He offers. It's the righteousness we have to offer to the world. Only in Christ is the righteousness the world needs to stand in that judgment. Let me finish with this. John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, here, listen to this, and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. If you've appropriated the righteousness of the judge, you don't even go to the judgment. What an offer. What an offer we have to proclaimly proclaim, to, to, to boldly proclaim to the world as Paul did. Let's pray. Lord, we sang about your mercy being more. Lord, we need that. We needed it at the point of our salvation. We need it on a daily basis. We sang about your grace. You're a loving, forgiving, gracious, merciful God. Thank you for <clears throat> making available to us through your son, the righteous judge, his own righteousness, that having appropriated it, we don't never come in, we don't ever come into that judgment room. I pray for those present who have not surrendered <clears throat> their hearts to you, that you would extend that grace and mercy to them. Make us bold in the proclamation of this message, even when the society gets rough. They need it more than ever. In Jesus' name, amen.